Welcome everyone. My name is Annette Johns and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's education event, Supporting Survivors of Suicide Loss, a Narrative and Reflective Approach. We have over 530 social workers from across Canada registered for this event this afternoon. This is Social Work Month, so happy Social Work Month, everyone. And the theme, Social Work is Essential, certainly highlights the important and essential role that social workers have in the development, management, and delivery of health and social programs. Through our work in diverse fields of practice, we are making a difference in enhancing the health and well-being of individuals, families, groups, and communities. Today's webinar is a collaboration between the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers and the Canadian Association of Social Workers. And it's always so wonderful when we can come together as a profession to learn from our social work colleagues and enhance our knowledge and skills in providing clients with the highest quality services. The webinar presentation today will be approximately 60 to 70 minutes, followed by a question and answer period that I will moderate. Please note that all the details you need, like how to access the slide deck and handouts and other housekeeping information is included in the widgets across the bottom of your screen. All the widgets can be accessed by clicking on those blue and white icons at the bottom of your screen. You can also resize and move around any elements you see on your screen to customize your viewing experience. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions using the question mark icon at any time, and I'll begin asking the questions during our designated question and answer period. Only the presentation team will see the questions. I now want to introduce our speaker, Kim Kelly. Kim is a proud registered social worker in Newfoundland and Labrador and a three-time alumni of Memorial University of Newfoundland, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Social Work, and a Master of Education. Kim is employed with Memorial Work as the BSW Student Services Coordinator. Outside of her work at Memorial, Kim is a suicide postvention consultant. <clears throat> Since losing her brother Brendan to, su to suicide, she has supported survivors of suicide loss and addressed the topic of suicide postvention as a panel member, presenter, and guest on local media, forums, and conferences. Kim co-created postvention support, including the annual vigil to remember those who died by suicide <clears throat> and the Noel J. Brown Day of Hope and Healing for survivors of suicide loss. In 2011, Kim received the Excellence in Leadership Award from Assist in L for her contribution to the healing of those affected by suicide in this province. Kim is also a proud member of the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers Promotion of the Profession Committee. I have worked with Kim for many years and she showcases her pride and enthusiasm for the social work profession every day. Kim, I'm really looking forward to your presentation this afternoon and I will now turn the virtual podium over to you. Thank you so much, Annette, and welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to have you join us today. So while I can't see you, I know that we're all in this together, so I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate the opportunity to help each other learn more about how to support survivors of suicide loss, because I really think it's um, it's an essential, an essential area of social work practice, for sure. So it's very fitting that we're doing this during uh, Social Work Month. So, of course, you've all read the description. So today I'm going to take you on a journey of my own uh, combination of personal and professional experience through, through the story of my family, through songs written by myself and my mom. And we're going to sing those songs to you, recorded versions, through our, my lived experience and theory. I'm really going to review the complicated nature of suicide loss and invite you to um, to share, to, to look at narrative practice and how it can be applied to uh, survivors of suicide loss. So in terms of our objectives, I'm going to introduce you to preferred language, uh, you know, invite your curiosity around narrative theory, enrich your own toolkit with some questions to explore in theory, some guidelines for practice, and some healing ideas for uh, working with suicide loss. And uh, perhaps most importantly, to share how we're turning loss into legacy here in Newfoundland and Labrador uh, in terms of how we're restoring uh, suicide loss. 
so rather than give you stats and rather than uh, share my own story first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a song I wrote called Better Place. And this is how I imagine it to be for someone who's um, considering suicide. And certainly I know firsthand what it is like to be left behind after, after losing my brother, Brendan. So I'm now going to... Um, play the song that I wrote and I should uh, give credit to my good friend Dan Dillon. He interpreted my lyrics for me and he plays guitar and piano on the song and he is singing the song with me. Actually, he's singing most of it because he's a way better singer than me. My, uh, my, my grade one teacher to open up my, told me to open up my lips and not let any sound come out. So disclaimer. Uh, I guess the other thing I should say before I, um, before I start playing the song is, you know, music can be very emotional. And certainly the whole theme of suicide loss can be emotional. So if you need to take a moment, step away from the presentation, talk to a colleague or a friend, uh, you know, and reach out as needed, uh, you know, to so just take the time you need for yourself there. I'm not sure that you're hearing the music. So what I invite you to do is um, going to, there's a little um, sound icon on the top there. So I'm going to invite you to uh, play that song you when you can alone. hear the music. Excellent. Or so the story goes. Why he had to leave us, well, nobody knows. Too many people end up this way That's what those left behind always say Was he just sad or numb in the pain? Were the thoughts in his head just driving him insane? Perhaps he thought of you and me Perhaps he was blinded and he could not see Why we are left, oh the question why Not even given a chance to say goodbye so many questions by those left behind Like a sad movie playing over in our mind Picture you in a much better place While it may not or have been that time Nor let me find a reason or all or a rhyme It's hard for those who were left behind Say a prayer for those who were left behind But there's so much that we need to do All just to honor you But honor you Our lives have changed, we must carry on. Why we left, oh, the question why? 
Not even given a chance to say goodbye The so many questions by those left behind Like a sad movie playing over in our mind Well, I'll just give you a second there. I know it's uh, music, as I said, can be emotional for sure. So hopefully that helps give you an understanding at the very beginning of what it might like, might like to be a survivor of suicide loss like myself. So that's one of the reasons I like to, um, to use that song. So thank you for, for listening. So now I'm going to introduce you to our family and the story of our family. So that picture on the left, you see those lovely red curtains, velvet curtains that we used years ago. So that's my family. Uh, you know, my two brothers, Scott in the middle and Brendan, the smallest one, and mom and dad, uh, because I am the daughter of Bill and Sheila. And that's very important for you to know about me Um you know, I am, a, in addition to Annette's introduction, I am a woman of faith. I'm a Catholic woman who's very involved in our Catholic community, a presentation associate, and I am a survivor of suicide loss. But before I became a survivor of suicide loss, I grew up in a very happy, healthy home where we danced in the kitchen. My dad does recitations and sings and was an actor in the local dinner theater in Fairland. My mom, singer, songwriter, uh, play, playwright, as uh, she wrote plays for our local community concerts. You know, we had um, games night every week, uh, fun times. We went sliding and skating as a family. My dad used to help us make our costumes and went uh, even dressed up with us for Halloween. We went mummering at Christmas time. You know, uh, we went to church together. My parents encouraged us all and supported the three of us to get an education. And we all did a post-secondary education. And, you know, we never knew. Uh, we were just a normal family, middle class. And, um, you know, we never thought suicide was going to happen to us. So we are an example that if suicide can happen in our family, it can truly happen in any family because we know that suicide loss, you know, knows no bounds, you know, regardless of education, you know, uh, race, religion, uh, you know, financial status, uh, et cetera. You know, it can really, truly, uh, you know, be in any family at any time, right? So uh, we are an example of that for sure. The picture on the right is the last picture we actually have of my brother living. So that's my brother Brendan on the left, uh, you know, and that was taken at my brother Scott's wedding. And this was in June of um, 2000. And my brother Brendan died in August of 2000. 
So this is a little glimpse of Brendan because I thought that, you know, you really should hear the story, his story, and like so many, because uh, suicide loss and a death by suicide is so much more than a statistic, right? So you can see that Brendan was a happy, healthy boy. I uh, was a beaver in the Boy Scouts. And, uh, you know, there's a picture of him with my mom and dad. He, Him and my brother loved clowning around uh, together and, and with me too. And Brendan was a great child chess player. My dad actually taught both boys how to play chess. Uh, he didn't teach me. He, he preferred to teach me how to speak in public, and I really appreciate that to this day. But Brendan won third place in a Canadian chess challenge a regional uh, in the regional finals. He won uh, the bronze medal there. So really proud of that. Brendan was, uh, you know, cross-country runner. He was involved in sports, uh, softball, uh, etc. Then in university, he got his uh, Bachelor of Arts from Memorial, and uh, the two uh, pictures at the top actually were a really good time in his life when he uh, he was involved with the Catholic community on campus. And him and uh, a friend, Karen, uh, who's a, a friend of my daughter, Pauline's, who's actually a social worker as well, and uh, they were co-chairs of a national Catholic student conference. And these are some um, things that people wrote to him, some messages, and uh, I really hold them dear and near and dear to my heart. On the bottom, Brendan stayed in residence, another place near and dear to my heart. I stayed in residence for 16 years as a residence life staff member and student at Memorial. And Brendan won Frosh of the Year in Bowater, something he was really proud of. And of course, there's a copy of his degree. So these are some really things I, you know, I really like to hold near and dear about Brendan and are, that are really part of his story. So now I'm going to reintroduce you because these are not new to you by any means. So, you know, a little refresher for you, perhaps, uh, uh, the three H's of suicide, right? So suicide prevention, uh, what we're all doing, no doubt, in our work to educate people on how to prevent suicide, no matter what area of practice we work in. And that, uh, you know, certainly is surrounds the hope, right? The hope that we live in that suicide can be prevented uh, and we have an active role in that as social workers for sure. Suicide intervention is those skills that we develop and the knowledge uh, to actually uh, help us intervene when somebody has suicidal ideation. So, that, so that's how we can help uh, those who are um, considering suicide. And today's, and they could be presentations all on their own for sure, uh, you know, but today's focus is suicide postvention and uh, the healing that's involved when a death has happened by suicide. So lots of people ask, well, you know, why, why is the, what is the importance of doing suicide postvention when the person has already died? Well, we know as social workers that everyone needs healing and counseling and support to help them through this traumatic loss. But also one of the things that we, we know um, or, or, or we must realize is that postvention, so that support uh, right after, you know, or following a suicide loss is actually prevention for the next generation. And that's compliments of my friend, uh, Dr. Frank Campbell, who's a big suicidologist in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, he says that early intervention is key, you know, that the earlier we can provide support and counseling is best. And of course, the reason why postvention is so important is because when suicide becomes familiar to people or is known to them, um, they're 40 times more likely to think about suicide themselves. In terms of language, um, you know, there's lots of different language, language around suicide loss, uh, suicide attempts, etc. So on the left is, uh, you know, more problematic language. And no doubt this is not language you use. And the only reason I'm, I'm, um, saying it to you is because I was, you know, I hear these terms all the time. So um, I was at a conference, a suicide conference there a couple of years ago, and the complete, the uh, keynote speaker kept calling um, uh, deaths by suicide successful suicides. Now, I can tell you that no family member ever wants to hear that their suicide 
or the loss of their loved one was successful. So certainly a uh, problematic language, much, much better to say death by suicide or simply suicide. One of the things also that we really want to uh, share and want you to share with me in our world is uh, to help get rid of the term committed suicide in our society uh, because, of course, it pathologizes suicide and suicide loss. So, um, you know, preferred terms are died by suicide, took their own life, ended their life, died by their own hand lost their battle with, um, you know, um, you may know, you may remember or seen uh, the wonderful Graham Band and Codco on CBC years ago. And Andy Jones was a, was a member of that cast. And Andy and Mary Lynn lost their son Louis to suicide. And that's the words they used in Louis' obituary, lost his battle with, um, uh, you know, or actually, sorry, no, that was another friend of mine said that they actually said um, died by his own hand. I'm sorry. That's what they said. So that was the first words in the obituary. But we're seeing more and more now in obituaries lost their battle with depression, lost their battle with uh, mental illness, lost the battle within themselves. That's what we're seeing more and more. So I want to spend time on that because I want you, every time you hear that word committed suicide, I want you to challenge somebody who said it and change their language around that. In terms of a suicide victim, victims of suicide, again, further victimizes, uh, you know, th those who died and those left behind. Better to say again, you know, the person who's, who has been impacted by suicide or uh, certainly a term that's very um, appropriate to use would be bereaved by suicide. My language is, I always say survivors of suicide loss, and that's the language that we're going to use in today's presentation. And of course, it's certainly acceptable to say person with uh, lived experience, for sure. And you can see these are three articles that were written about uh, a vigil that uh, I lead uh, called uh, Vigil to Remember People Who Died by Suicide. And you can see that they're the language that uh, you know, even the media was using, right? Suicide victims remembered in candlelight service. Uh, service remembers victims of suicide. And the, and suicide is the ultimate rejection, right? Very, uh, you can see how language really changes the way, you know, that uh, the media and the community looks at suicide. So we're really trying to restory how th that language and, and how we look at suicide. So, of course, we all know that uh, suicide is one of the many different, um, you know, complicated loss for sure. And, uh, you know, there's so many different thing, reasons why it's complicated. There's different family reactions. Even in my own family, you know, uh, I had my brother to, you know, local hospitals and to private therapy. And my brother, who works with the Coast Guard, was up in alert at the time when Brendan died. And, you know, he had to fly on a helicopter on his own, then fly from Edmonton to St. John's all by himself. And, you know, he had lots of time, I guess, on his hands to think about Brendan Brendan's death, uh, you know, without any interruptions and, or without any support. And he says to this day, you know, if I had been here, Brendan would still be alive. So you can see that even in our own family, uh, you know, there's different reactions. And what I often see too often is, you know, the breakdowns of family, right? Maybe, you know, when a child has died, the mom will think very differently than the dad or, or the parents, you know, whatever role they play. And, you know, suddenly, you know, then we have a divorce, uh, you know, or a breakdown of that family because they have such different reactions about what's happened. Of course, there's no opportunity to say goodbye, right? So we leave, there's that incompleteness in that. Often, depending on the type of death, there's no opportunity to view the loved one in death. Certainly COVID has, has certainly changed all that because most people now get cremated. But pre-COVID times, I mean, in Newfoundland and Labrador, many people are still having traditional um 
you know, caskets and, and different things like that. So, you know, there was no opportunity. We often, suicide had a closed casket, what we call, but certainly we're changing now, uh, thankfully, uh, even in terms of uh, being able to, you know, have uh, our loved ones cremate. It certainly makes a difference for that as well, but certainly doesn't help with the closure sometimes, right? There's little or no invitations to talk about their loved one or suicide loss, unlike other, um, you know, other forms of death. You know, my mom and dad always went around to support uh, parents who lost children, you know, all along our southern shore of this province. And, you know, one time my mom went to a funeral and she said, I'm so sorry for your son's loss. You know, uh, we we know how, now my mom has grade eight education. So as uh, she said, you know, we know how you feel. And the woman looked at her and she said, no, no, you don't. She said, your son chose to die. She said, my son fought to live. So, you know, there's such different reactions and, and different, uh, you know, even though my mom was not invited to talk about that, she did and, of course, faced uh, some repercussions uh, for doing that. And people don't always know how to act around um, the suicide loss. Relationships change. For example, you know, for that uh, spouse who lost another spouse, suddenly, you know, maybe uh, most of their friends revolved around that other spouse they had, and, and suddenly relationships change, right? Um, or if it, it's your child that died, you know, their friends are no longer coming around, or their family members, or you're not going to hockey games, or different things like that. So things become so different, and people become distant. And and, um, and, you know, it, it, suicide makes that more complicated. People don't always know what resources are available or how to access them. Of course, uh, you know, often with suicides, when somebody dies in the home, family members are, uh, you know, the first people to find them. So uh, PTSD can set in and there's no opportunity for critical incident stress debriefing, unlike if, if um, you know, the person was found by, you know, a first responder, for example, right? They'd automatically get that critical incident stress debriefing at work, but family members are not invited to do that. When a death occurs in the home, uh, you know, police involvement is automatic. And of course, there might be an intrusive investigation. You know, um, is it possible that this person died by homicide, for example? That was a question that was asked to us because my brother died by, um, by gunshot. And so lots of different, uh, you know, questions that can be asked. And of course, I don't need to tell you, my social work colleagues, about feelings after loss and death, because some of you are dealing with that in your areas of practice or perhaps in your own lives. So, of course, there's often the normal feelings, right? All of those that you uh, see, particularly, you know, uh, numbness, right? Very normal feeling or despair or, you know, all of those things are certainly uh, normal feelings. Loneliness when you've lost a partner of 30 years, etc. But when suicide happens, you know, these there's additional things that happen. So there's stigma sometimes. It is changing, thankfully, uh, you know, with lots of different, you know, sessions like we're doing today and Bell Let's Talk and, and all the great work that you as social workers are doing in our community. So it is changing. But Families still feel that stigma and shame. Sometimes people are embarrassed, right, to face others or to say that my loved one died by suicide. There's often uncertainty within families, depending on the type of death. You know, I, I know several families who, you know, that they, they're even within their own family, they view things differently because they say, well, you know, my brother went over the boat. He didn't die by suicide, right? And then the other half of the family says, you know, they can't come to that. They can't come to that realization at all, right? Which, which, which further breeds, um, you know, just that complication within their own family. There's often a blame of self and others. Some people might even feel a relief, right? For when they were so worried about their loved one, maybe they were worried, you know, they were coming in all times of the night and now suddenly they're, they're at peace, right? And so there's some feelings around that. There's all some, some feel guilt, you know, um, what could I have done? You know, why did I not see the signs? You know, uh, what if I had gotten help or, you know, et cetera. 
There's fear of rejection and abandonment by family and friends. There's a constant yearning, right, for that, uh, for the deceased and for the incompleteness and for the closure that, uh, you know, that they didn't have, right? Because there's unresolved issues and concerns. And of course, there's anxiety, right, around facing others and, and all those types of things. I remember that, you know, some of these things, even with my own family, you know, my dad couldn't speak. I don't think for weeks he could speak. And my mom, who, you know, who was such a force of nature, suddenly I saw her cry, you know, for the first time in her life. And she lost that strength being the matriarch of her family for a long time. And she didn't get it back for, you know, a long time, right? So um, lots of these feelings are certainly very real for sure. The suicide survivors have complicated questions. You know, why did this happen? Some of those things I've already mentioned. You know, what if I, you know, if my phone hadn't have died and I, you know, I had seen the message that they were trying to reach me. How did I, did I not see any signs? You know, um, what if I had been able to do more? You know, what if, what if? You know, uh, the constant questions that are just, as I indicated in my song, they're like a sad movie, right? These questions going over and over in, in our minds. You know, uh, all of those questions are so important to explore in theory, in therapy, as well as, you know, really practical things that people need help with in terms of how do I tell my children? you know, that their dad died by suicide or that their parent died by suicide? How do I tell my grandchildren? You know, how do I face people? How do I manage all this grief that I'm feeling for myself and still look after my family? You know, especially if it's, uh, you know, a spouse who died, right? Um, you know, and yet, you know, for the, for the parent who's lost their child, I am not a parent, but I have seen that there is no greater loss than for a parent to lose a child. My brother was 24 years old when he died and suicide in Canada happens as young as 10 years old, right? So, you know, people, people are still struggling with how do I remember my child, you know, and, and not be surrounded by all of these things regard, related to suicide. How will I share, you know, uh, with others? How do I open up to people? Um, you know, those types of things, right? And also, I mean, uh, here in Newfoundland, we are real conversationalists. Uh, we might have a reputation for that for sure. And I mean, you know, the questions when you see somebody maybe that you haven't seen for a long time, or, you know, how are you doing? How are you getting on? What are you at? You know, as Alan Doyle made, had made some of those things famous. But, um, you know, how are your kids, you know? How do you answer that question when you've just lost a child? Or how is your husband or your spouse, you know, when you just lost your husband? How many, or, you know, you're meeting someone for the first time and somebody asks, how many siblings do you have? Or how many children do you have? Because the next question is, well, what do they do? Right? So whenever I'm with my mom and my mom is asked that question, I'll, I'll end up answering that for her because she'll just automatically start to cry actually when somebody asks her that question. So, you know, depending on the situation, you'll really help have to help your, um, you know, the people that you're working with learn how to answer that. So depending on what kind of frame of mind they're in or what the environment is or what kind of safe space it is, you know, they might say, well, I have two living uh, children or three living children, right? That may be a way to phrase it. Or I have, you know, because the minute you say, I have three children, somebody says, well, what do they do? And now then you're trying to scram and say, well, you know, well, you know, my daughter's a social worker, my son is a sea captain, and uh, my son Brendan died, you know. So you can see how these simple questions that we ask every day can become very complicated and people really need to um, learn how to answer that. And especially when you say, you know, so-and-so died, then uh, the next question is, how did they die? Right. So helping them answer those kind of questions. And of course, oh, my gosh, you know, my son died. He was 24 or, you know, your son died 24. How did that happen? You know, again, people of the best of intentions, but people are asking these questions um, all the time. 
So now I want to uh, share a narrative practice that was used with me by uh, the, uh, the great Ellen Oliver, who uh, is a social worker here in this province and no stranger to CASW after being a president of CASW. And, and she worked with us at the School of Social Work. And she introduced me to narrative therapy. And uh, it's really now my therapy of choice to use um, with survivors of suicide loss, whether it's individuals, families, group work, etc. And so I just want to acknowledge Ellen. And part of uh, the next several slides come from a presentation Ellen and I did in 2014 uh, with the NL, well, a, well, now CSW, and when we did it during Social Work Month. So uh, thank you, Ellen, for introducing me to this uh, therapy. So why narrative? Well, narrative is story. And here in Newfoundland, and I know many different cultures and different groups, story is very important, right? Uh, stories help keep elements of our loved ones alive, uh, you know, and also, our stories are greater than our physical selves, right? We know that, you know, in this life, we are all going to leave this world at some point. But we hope that while our physical selves are gone, that our stories will remain because they're greater than our physical selves. Um, you know, and we certainly want... We certainly want to believe that everyone wants to be remembered no matter how they died. Narrative also uh, helps us challenge the myths, you know, that people really believe that we must get over or move on after death. Narrative also helps us see, uh, you know, and social workers, you, you would love this as, and I know this is a refresher for you that, you know, it really focuses on, we, we believe, anyway that um, every person has resources and strengths and that people are generally cooperative and want to share. Narrative also helps the person, uh, the loved one, those left behind after suicide, take control of the story and share what is remembered, right? So, um, you know, it, it keeps the focus on the person's life and not the death, not the suicide. It helps keep our loved ones close, right? Because narrative is, uh, really believes that, um, you know, death is the end of a life, but not the end of a relationship, or certainly narrative helps us see see that for sure. And it helps us remember and continue relationships in that way. It, it helps us keep stories and memories of our loved ones alive, which is what we want people to remember. After this presentation today, I want you to remember my brother, Brendan, and things about him and not how he died. But I guess at the same time, uh, I wouldn't be here speaking to you today if Brendan hadn't died by suicide. We can use the best part of the past, and that's what I was sharing with Brendan to you uh, ab about him today. And, uh, you know, use the best part of the story, the best part of the past. And, you know, narrative also allows us to have elements of faith and spirituality uh, as well. And, you know, too often, I know in, in social work practice, you know, we, we don't have a tendency sometimes to recognize the value of faith and spirituality and what that can actually mean for, uh, you know, for people. It is my experience that uh, faith and spirituality can give a lot of comfort to people. And while it may not be for everyone, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to at least consider those elements because people who you're working with may, may actually be able to experience some benefit from faith and spirituality. And of course, spiritual needs of loss, belonging, sense of community, we all want those things, right? And we may not call them spiritual, uh, but certainly uh, some do. And uh, spirituality involves honoring the person. In terms of uh, spiritual beliefs and faith traditions and all of those things, they can really become part of the conversations that we have about our loved one. Some people who've experienced loss uh, find great comfort from maybe the voice of God, Creator, Allah, you know, uh, saints, the prophets, or some kind of higher power. And of course, um, one thing that uh, suicide um, 
loss means for people is, you know, people who get to experience the normal end of life with ritual and traditions, people who've a lost loved one to suicide are sometimes robbed of those rituals and traditions. So um, narrative helps us realize what kind of rituals and traditions we can keep including them in, uh, you know, after after our loved ones are gone. And of course, you know, we. So, what I hear more and more is people want some sign that their loved one is in a better place, right? Whatever that means for them. For some people, it means with God. For some people, it means heaven. For some people, it just means that, that they're at peace. So uh, signs are very much a part of the conversations I have with survivors of loss. And, you know, that's the one thing they want to cling on to sometimes. You know, I seen a butterfly today and that reminded me of so-and-so. Or, uh, you know, people more and more are talking about pennies from heaven or seeing dimes or even even to feel that expression, wind in the trees, right? And all of these types of things that they're looking for some kind of sign. My mom, who's, uh, you know, a devout Catholic, was looking for a sign and she asked, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, our Blessed Mother, uh, <laughs> you know, for a sign that, uh, my, you know, my brother was at peace because that was something my family was really struggling with, you know, because he died by suicide and all the things we learned about suicide over the years that have been negatively ingrained in us, you know, they wondered, you know, is Brendan in heaven? So my mom uh, asked for that sign. And uh, uh, there's a picture here, and I'm going to invite you to uh, look upon that and in his corsage uh, see if you see a sign. I'm not going to ask you about that, but she saw a sign, and uh, she saw that it was, um, you know, the blessed lady, uh, you know, or a veiled lady that she saw, which gave her peace. And... Um, Again, I, I should say as a disclaimer, I didn't say earlier that certainly these are my views and, and uh, so certainly these are not elements that will speak to everyone. Uh, but I thank you for listening to me as I'm as I'm sharing my story and our family story. Narrative practices are, of course, all about uh, remembering conversations and how we uh, remember uh, the conversations and the people, how we make meaning you know, of life and of those things which matter to us, how we stay connected, even though our loved ones have gone, you know, how do we ensure that this relationship continues? And of course, narrative also looks at, um, you know, the downgrading and upgrading of membership in, uh, you know, what we call uh, the club of life. And of course, uh, decentered introductions, which uh, is a practice I learned from uh, Ellen Oliver, who I mentioned earlier there. So remembering is about consciously including the memories of our loved ones in stories, songs, conversations, traditions, and rituals. Um, my nephews, uh, Liam and Kean, who are 17 and uh, 12, uh, never knew Brendan physically because he had passed away before, you know, a few years before Liam was born in particular. And they know Brendan as though he lived because we have shared Brendan's story. We remember him at Grace. We, we all have, uh, you know, an ornament on the tree with his picture on it. And we remember his traditions and, and the, or we remember him and, and those things in our traditions. So we're consciously including his memories, um, in what is happening. So, and so, you know, even though Brendan is gone, our relationship still continues and he's still a very important member of our life club as it is according to uh, narrative practice. And one of the reasons why this remembering is so important is because there's really a desire to stay connected, right? Because, because the person has died, our feelings haven't changed. The person isn't here. But again, you know, especially for those parents who have lost the children, right? Or, or your spouse who's the, the, the parent of your child, you know, those, those, there's still some connections there that people want to, um, to go on. So I'm now going to go through this, uh, 
you know, these questions, I'm, I'm not going to read them all out to you, but certainly they can certainly make a difference in terms of um, how the questions can help the person that you're working in focus on the life lived and the person rather than the death. So, you know, by asking these questions to make meaning, how did the person add value to your life? What kind of messages or, or you know, lessons did you learn from them? Um, you know, how have you connected with your loved ones since their death? What kind of activities have honored, uh, have occurred to honor or include your loved one? Or might you do to honor or include your loved one? You know, who have you talked to about your loved one? You know, all of these are very positive questions to help the person really share that story of their loved one. Now, of course, you know, because as social workers, we also know that, uh, you know, we have to be there for those tough times and those tough questions. You know, these are kind of tough questions that we would kind of ask, um, you know, or kind of explore with uh, this people that we're working with. You know, how will you manage being distanced from your loved one, right? Because that's how they're feeling. How will you manage uh, being distanced from some relationships? Um, you know, how will you manage the change in status and, and feeling less connected. I, I don't use these a whole lot because, um, you know, I'm really trying to focus on more the inspirational story and the positive view. However, there are certainly times in my therapy and work with individuals that these questions have had to come up because they're, they're experiencing difficulty through them and we must um, explore, explore them for sure. Upgrading. How has your loved one inspired you? You know, uh, what might you do to keep them close? Uh, you know, how would your life change if you lived with them through their eyes? And all of these questions can be asked as part of decentered introductions. And of course, uh, this uh, technique or practice can be used um, in journaling, in your individual work, group work, etc., where we're uh, inviting the person, or the survivor of suicide loss, to introduce the person who has died, right? Uh, what is their name? What the relationship? What kind of things did they, they do? What did you love about them? What kind of hobbies or talents did they have? What kind of work did they do? Um, you know, what do you want others to know about them? And this is just a list of all of those questions combined. And there's a couple of, uh, of extra ones there as well. So you can certainly, I, I wanted to put them on there so that this can be your takeaway piece that you can have it all together and use in your, in your different practices. But I remember when, um, you know, that, uh, when Ellen Oliver asked me the question, you know, what do you think Brendan would think about all this work you're doing in his honor? And I'll talk about a little bit of that work later on. And, you know, until that she asked me that question, I never once thought about what Brendan would think about my worker. And, you know, it suddenly gave me great peace and inspiration for, you know, knowing that, my gosh, you know, he would, I think, like that he's being remembered, that I'm consciously remembering him and still sharing his story 20 years after he has died. And, you know, it really changed um, how I viewed Brendan's death and how I'm sharing his story and doing this work today. So uh, this is a very, I'm, I'm proof that this, these questions can really work and help transform, uh, you know, your own story uh, and uh, restory suicide loss. In terms of guidelines for working uh, with survivors, always use uh, the loved one's first name. Very important. People love to hear about uh, people's first name. My mom loves to hear this. Uh, we love to hear when people, you know, hear stories about Brendan and, and all of those kind of things. Be direct. Whatever you do, you know, don't worry about talking around the suicide. It's really, you might be the only one who was able to talk to this person around suicide and suicide loss. So be direct, don't talk around it. And as we know, do what you always do best. Create that space to talk about what has happened. Use the preferred language that we talked about. Uh, you know, plan an intervention counseling support as early as possible for the reasons I talked about earlier. Help the people you are working with uh, prepare for holidays and important dates and some of those questions that they will be asked. Important messages that are really important for you to share with those who have uh, lost loved ones. You are not responsible for the actions of your, lo of your loved one. It is not your fault. 
you know, really important. Uh, you know, no one is responsible for the actions of another. So it's real. That's the most important message you can share with them. They are not responsible. Be kind, be gentle with yourself. Take care of yourself. You know, uh, that spiritual side of me, uh, you know, uh, would, would, you know, uh, reminds people all the time, give permission to forgive yourself, right? Uh, to, to get rid of, to help reduce that blame and guilt that you feel, you know, and, and forgive others, forgive your loved one who died. Uh, it took me a while to forgive Brendan, uh, you know, for taking his own life and forgive others, you know, and, etc. And uh, very important. It is okay to uh, create new memories, uh, you know, and, and they must create new memories, right? Because we must have to learn to live our life without our loved ones. And um, it's really important to tell them it's okay to laugh and rediscover joy. It took a while for my family to do that, uh, you know, but but we did. And we are examples that it can happen. And it's not, you know, people say, my gosh, I don't want to be disrespectful to my loved one. Or it, it might feel like, um, you know, I'm losing them forever if I, you know, or, or the, that, uh, you know, I'm forgetting them. Well, it doesn't mean that they're forgetting them, right? It just means that you're trying to recreate a new life for yourself without your loved one. So that's really, really important. Other ways that you can be helpful. Uh, I know that most of you will not be involved uh, in your areas of practice with helping to plan a funeral or celebrating someone's life, but I added this one in particular because, uh, you know, suicide knows no bounds, as we talked about earlier. So it might be that you're helping, you know, the cousin of a spouse, right, uh, uh, who has passed away, and you're trying to help the family deal with that because we know as social workers, it's not just the work that we're doing day to day, but we're social workers for life in every aspect of what we do. So it's possible that you might have to help, you know, plan. And one of the most difficult things for people is actually when someone has passed away, you know, because uh, here in Newfoundland, when we go into funeral homes, there are, we really are a people of celebrating uh, people's lives. And you go in, sometimes you hear the laughter and the stories, you know, but guaranteed when a suicide happens, People are, are afraid to talk and, and share those happy memories and times. So it's really important um, to, uh, you know, if you get the opportunity to help out in this way, to provide direction to the family or somebody, uh, your friend of the family, to have a little journal at the funeral home, to invite people to write memories, favorite, you know, stories of that loved one. Because when everybody goes home and the funeral is over, you know, and that per the people have time to reflect and, and they want to hear memories of their loved one. You know, um, we're seeing more and more now, uh, you know, across, no doubt uh, in all places across Canada, we all have, you know, all funeral homes now have opportunities where people can write little stories and memories. And I'm still seeing when a death happens by suicide, there's still that fear or, um, you know, people are not sharing those stories as much as they are when somebody dies by other means and so um, you know we please help help us encourage people to write stories about their loved one yes by all means acknowledge the sadness of this loss but you know families will benefit most by learning about their loved one and learning about those stories so uh, because they're really part of their therapy uh, moving on so, you know, and now we're seeing, you know, having somebody post positive uh, stories and memories on Facebook, you know, I don't use Facebook, but I certainly see that there's a value in it uh, for certain things, for sure. Other healing activities, of course, you know all these. So, uh, you know, uh, certainly they're all part of what we should be uh, uh, advocating in social work. Uh, you know, everything from yoga and meditation to journaling and um, counseling, etc. And um, writing a letter to their loved one. Uh, I know I found this really helpful myself and you can use, um, you know, in the work that I do and you can use those questions that we talked about, you know, in the, um, in the decent introductions right or, or any of those questions they can be a helpful technique for people for sure um 
connecting with people's law, connecting with other survivors of loss, that's very important, especially because some uh, many relationships have ended or changed for sure at the very least, that it's really important for them to connect and talk about suicide loss uh, with other people who understand. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have the great Tina Davies, who started a Survivors of Suicide Loss support group, and, she, and that group is in existence now for 16 years. And so certainly, you know, there's lots of different groups around so in your area to encourage your, your uh, survivor to reach out to those groups and help them access them if they don't know how. Uh, we also lead um, a Hope and Healing Day. Uh, the third Sunday, the third Saturday, I'm sorry, in November, which is actually the International Day for Survivors of Suicide Loss. So we do have a day for those left behind after suicide. Tina and I have led this day for a number of years. We didn't uh, in 2020 because of uh, COVID, but we hope to lead that again in um, 2021. And the reason we didn't do it virtually is because we really felt it was important to be in the same room to provide support, um, you know, in person for that particular type of day that we had. Um, 16 years ago, I, I started a vigil to remember people who died by suicide. It happens on the second Sunday in December every year, and it's hosted by um, a local church here. This year, we did it virtually for the first time. And, uh, you know, we had over uh, a thousand views and people were able to participate uh, virtually, which was great. It was, the you know, I was really, we were nervous about what COVID was doing to our vigil, but in actual fact, it allowed more people to join in and remember loved ones. And there's a wonderful slideshow in there. And if you're looking for some ideas of how to start this kind of vigil or support activity in your own community, or you're helping others, um, you know, this is a great resource for you. And the link is there. We're not going to open that up right now, but certainly for you to, um, to view it in there. And of course, we talked about some of these earlier, the importance of, you know, uh, survivors exploring new interests, hobbies, and traditions, right? If we were here in the room, I would show you a, a memory box I created for Brendan with all of these things that I like to take out and remember uh, him. And of course, you'll hear a little later uh, my, my mom's song, uh, you know, uh, how she wrote about um, you know, how it's important, important healing tip for her. Attend a workshop, uh, you know, safe talk or assist. And, you know, one of the other things that's really been working in our province is people who are doing great things to remember loved ones who've died by suicide. And this is a great, uh, you know, quote there that, um, you know, by Lorraine Hedke and John Winslade. And, uh, you know, let us not, the pain of grief is not to follow a prefabricated model, but to craft one's own responses. And that's really important for survivors of loss, that we must craft our own responses to how we're dealing with loss and how we're sharing that story. And some other helpful uh, quotes there about, you know, suicide should be restoried so as not to blot out all aspects of a person's life. And now we're going to share some stories in Newfoundland. So this is Tina Davies, who I mentioned on the right. Uh, and this is her son, Richard, uh, you know, who passed away when he was a teenager. Tina has started Richard's Legacy Foundation, which has done enormous, uh, wonderful support for people of this province, for individuals, families, groups, and communities. And she's become a real uh, consultant for, you know, the government. Uh, her and I sit on the Towards Recovery Council that's in effect by the, uh, you know, here in our province. And, you know, we're, we really appreciate how our government here in this province has really reached out to survivors and consulted with us on, you know, how we promote life. And we're really grateful. But Tina has done enormous things in Richard's name. So Richard will always live on because his legacy continues through her work and all of the fundraising and awareness and education that she does. This is... Um, Allison on the top right hand picture, Allison Walsh and her mom worked with us at Memorial University and uh, Allison loved horses and there's an annual Spirit Horse Day that uh, remembers Allison, uh, you know, and there's some links there to learn more about that if you would like to. 
This is Jacob Pottister who died in 2016. And uh, I actually went to, uh, grew up with Jacob's mom, Marley, because she's from my community of Cape Royal. And uh, this foundation has raised thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and awareness in Jacob's name. And they really, um, you know, shined a light on uh, suicide loss and how Jacob's death can be used, um, you know, to raise awareness and help others. You know, they're a great foundation. People can apply to them for money and do all different types of things. So lots of great uh, legacy work happening in, uh, in Jacob's memory. This is uh, Corporal Trevor O'Keefe, who uh, is actually from my area as well. He's from, grew up in Torscove. I went to university with him, although I didn't, uh, you know, hang around with him as such, but certainly knew who he was. And uh, he was involved in communications here in the province. He was uh, the face of the RCMP uh, in terms of communications, and he died by uh, suicide, had post-traumatic stress, and, um, you know, uh, suffered with that for a while. They do an annual walk in his name, as you can see in the picture there. And his parents are actually, um, have built a house in, in Torsco. And, um, if you view that link there, you can, one of those links, you can actually see it in, in a lookout spot where he loved to look out on the expanse ocean in Torsco. And it's up a dusty road and it's called Salancha, which is a Gaelic word meaning, uh, uh, healing and good health. And so it's called the road to good health. And uh, that's how people are remembering Trevor. This is uh, my mom and I with the Ennis sisters. If you don't know them, there are three lovely uh, young women whose their mom uh, grew up with my dad in Cape Royal. And they do a lot of work around mental health. Uh, you know, they actually have a song called Shining a Light on Mental Health. And they wrote a song actually called Sing You Home, which remembers their cousin Stephen, who died by suicide. And um, this song, even though it was written to remember their cousin uh, Stephen Brocklehurst, who died, um, has was now has been adopted by uh, the Rooms here, which is a heritage. Um, place or a museum, uh, for lack of a better word, and uh, to commemorate our uh, 100th anniversary of um, the First World War, their song was, ad was adapted for that and has now been sung from St. John's to France. So what started as a song, remembering their cousin Stephen, has now helped people and helped look at remembering in so many different ways from St. John's to Beaumont Tamil. Uh, in our own way, our own family, uh, you know, uh, we have our own CD with um, things that are happening, uh, you know, that my mom wrote five songs. As you can see, I wrote a song. My brother did recitations. My brother and I sing a couple songs. And we raised some money. We raised about $10,000 from this CD uh, just through uh, word of mouth. We never sold it in a store or anything like that. Um, uh, but we used this to create a scholarship for Brendan, and I'm going to talk about that. But now I'm going to play uh, a song about Brendan's life and how she remembers him. And uh, hopefully you're going to um, be able to hear that song. Memories are all I have of you Writing this is the hardest thing to do God only knows why we had to part Cause you are always in my heart How dad and I Oh, so handsome and so tall We were so happy and so glad We didn't know we'd be so sad No one knows what the future holds Good Lord of the God For twenty-four years we had you We had you and your love Memories are all I have of you Writing this is the heart 
hardest thing to do. God only knows why we had to part. Cause you are always in my heart. On that bright September morn, the glorious day when you were born, your sister and brother so proud called your name right out loud grew up left home and went to mom we were so proud of our youngest son we didn't know About you every day. Memories are all I have of you. Writing this is the hardest thing to do. God only knows why we had to part. Cause you are always in my heart. God gave to us a precious boy. We cared for you with so much joy. Life turned out to be sad. Now in heaven with your dad. Thank you very much for listening to that. Uh, I really think it's important that you hear uh, because she sang that song and wrote that song from her heart about what she remembers, uh, you know, about Brendan. And, uh, you know, I hope it helps you see the sadness, too, that still exists for her, right, and in the eyes of a mom. This is uh, the cover of a book I wrote about my dad. And we, uh, you know, on, I think because my brother died by suicide, you know, my dad had been a cancer survivor uh, for 18 years and he, he fought so hard to live. And I think it was so hard for my dad in particular to, um, to have lost Brendan by suicide because, you know, uh, my dad felt that he didn't fight, you know, to live in the same way that he did. But my dad was a great man in our community and I could do a whole presentation about uh, preparing for end of life, uh, with my dad, uh, you know, and, and how that worked. But essentially when, when we knew my dad was terminal, uh, you know, lots of people came and, uh, visited him in his final two months of his life and I invited them to write stories of uh, dad's life favorite memories just what I'm asking you to do today about um survivors of suicide loss about their lives and when they left I read it to him and actually you know we learned lots of different things and and uh, we actually held an Irish wake a living wake with dad living where we did toast to him and we sang songs and danced all while he was living uh, you know and I wrote a book about that whole experience and about him and uh, we're really grateful to family and friends who read the book and they used to give donations when they read it because we only printed a few books books but we raised uh, together between the sales of the CD and the book uh, you know we raised enough to endow a scholarship uh, for my brother Brendan and I think we were the first scholarship ever at Memorial to include the word suicide in the description 
So essentially, uh, you know, you can see on there that it does say uh, it was established to remember Brendan who died by suicide. But then it says, you know, it, it goes on about his BA and about how he was actively engaged in residence life, the Catholic community, and was dedicated to hard work, uh, you know, and volunteer initiatives. And uh, we started giving this award out for $500 and it's now up to 700 because of the money that we raised. This is Thomas O'Brien, a registered social worker here in our province, who, when he was a student, was the first recipient of that award. And we get such pleasure out of prepare, out of giving this award. So my mom was there and uh, my husband, Mike, uh, because Mike and uh, you know I get money taken out of our checks to to uh, to help fund this scholarship. This is Jessica Cal, another registered social worker who was the second recipient of the award there and presented by mom and my brother Scott. Um, Nicole Undergan, another, uh, another recipient there from the Cape Shore. Paulette Elms, uh, again, another, they're all uh, graduated now have and are registered social workers. And there's some people who helped us uh, raise some money. Um, people in this province might recognize uh, Sheila Guy Murphy there. So she helped, really helped us uh, raise some money as well. So that's her. And uh, oh, I should say that, uh, let's see, the um, we didn't get to give out the award last year in person, uh, but Sarah Williams Hutchings was the recipient in uh, 2020. Memorial and our Department of uh, Development, I think we were giving, you know, all this little bits of money, pockets of money, $20 here, $40 here, you know, $100 here to fund Brendan's scholarship. It actually came to their attention that, you know, we're really trying to raise awareness and of um, Brendan's scholarship. And so we had people over there, uh, you know, join us and get money taken out of their checks for this scholarship. And, um, Memorial University did a story about Brendan and the loss. And as you can see, they titled it Giving to Memorial Students, Honoring the Life of a Son and Brother. And um, in 2018, this story was so popular that when they reviewed the 400 stories of all the stories they did for the university in that year, Brendan's story made one of the top stories of the year and people had viewed it the most. So uh, the April story was remembering Brandon. So if you'd like to go in and see a little bit about uh, our own story in words, you can certainly um, go in and uh, and view that. But we were really happy because it really helped restory Brandon's story of loss for us and uh, look at how we're using his life and legacy to continue the work that he did uh, in his own community service by giving back to social work students who are now continuing continuing that legacy and sharing, you know, and helping support survivors of suicide loss. Um, so that's the really official uh, end of the presentation there. I'll just quickly go through the next couple of slides. I acknowledged Ellen earlier, but I really want to thank you because suicide loss is so important in our communities and we need you uh, to help support survivors of loss because this work uh, is so important and is essential for social work. And, uh, you know, I hope that you consider a narrative uh, to add to your theories. I know that it won't all always be that one theory you're going to um, focus on, but it certainly has elements which you can incorporate into your practice. And, you know, thank you for joining and listening to me and my mom as we shared our songs as well. And uh, this is the month of March, so I'm a very uh, Irish girl, and I celebrate St. Patrick's Day, and I wear green. I started uh, yesterday. I will wear it every day with in increasing amounts until March 17th. So I wanted to end with a little blessing I have for each of you. So wherever you go, whatever area of practice you do, may pride in the social work profession be always with you. And that's my, uh, my hope for you all. There's some references here as well as some web resources that you can look up. And um, now going to turn it over to Annette to uh, answer your questions.
Okay, uh, thank you so much, Kim, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have arrived at the question and answer period and we do have um, a significant amount of time. Uh, so we'll do our best to get through the questions. However, keep them coming in. I'm still monitoring the uh, Q&A box. Uh, so you can still, uh, you still have time to ask some questions. However, we do, um, you, you know, thank you for your understanding if we're not able to get to all of them in the next uh, little while. So Kim, uh, one of the first questions uh, that we have is regarding uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, someone is wondering if in your experience, what has been the pre pre prevalence sorry, of PTSD for survivors of suicide loss when they find uh, their loved ones? Oh, now, that's a really good question. I mean, <sighs> Most people who find their loved ones experience some element of post-traumatic stress, right? Whether it be short-term or, um, you know, or, or more long-term, you know, sometimes it, so there, that's why the importance of getting uh, support and counseling as early as possible. So early intervention is key uh, to help reduce that as much as they can, right? So, uh, you know, with my own, my own father found Brendan and, um, you know, my dad, um, really felt when he went in, uh, because we were, uh, you know, he, he felt that the angels had uh, laid Brendan out, you know, and we talked about that as a family. I wasn't a social worker when Brendan died. I was, uh, I actually was a social work student and I just finished my first practicum. Uh, and I actually took a year leave of absence from the program because I, I wondered at that time whether social work was even for me and whether I would continue after that loss. And it was my mom who convinced me <laughs> that I should pursue that and that Brendan would want that and that I would want that for myself when I realized uh, that time. So, um, you know, it's, um, I think PTSD is the one thing that's probably not acknowledged in terms of suicide loss and that sometimes people don't even uh, realize that family members are, are going through there. So I don't have any stats on that. I, I know I'm, there's lots of questions there, but I know I'm probably not answering it to the best of, to the way that you asked it, but certainly it's very uh, evident and it's often hidden and, uh, you know, um, for most survivors of loss and not explored and needs to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. Um, in terms of statistics, do you, uh, do you have any statistics on how many uh, people die by uh, suicide in Canada each year? Well, there's around 4,000 people die by suicide in Canada each year, according to the Public Health Agency of Canada. And suicide is actually uh, the ninth leading cause of death all ages in Canada. So, you know, first being cancer, heart disease, etc. Suicide is actually the ninth overall cause of death. And it's actually the second leading cause of death uh, for uh, children age 10 or youth um, age 10 to 19 in our, in our, in our country. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question is around, um, in terms of siblings, so what can you do with siblings who've lost an, a sibling to suicide, who, you know, are saying they're fine and they don't want to talk about their feelings? Is there anything that, uh, that we can do in, the, in that type of situation? Okay. Well, um, certainly it depends on the ages of them too, right? So if they're children, uh, you know, you can always get them to uh, draw a picture of how they're feeling or maybe draw a picture of, of some things. Um, I, I guess, you know, even though... Um, you know, all of these questions that I asked are wonderful questions. As we know, not all uh, therapies work with everyone and not all practices work with everyone, right? So one of the things um, that we, we do have to respect, if people don't want to talk about um, uh, their feelings, we might have to respect that, uh, you know, uh, unless, of course, uh, we know the limits of confidentiality, we'll certainly have to, uh, you know, reach out and, and uh you know, if somebody is suicidal, we certainly have to get help for them in that way. 
But if, if rather than focus on just feelings, um, you know, we can certainly use some of those questions that we asked in terms of trying to look at the person who died and maybe out of those stories and the sharing of the story of their loved one, we may, feelings might come up, uh, you know, because not everybody, uh, and especially, you know, um, I've encountered that a lot, uh, that people don't want to talk about their feelings. What they want to talk about is their loved one. And, uh, you know, and, and talking about their loved one, you know, does spill over, uh, you know, certainly into talking about that loss. And, uh, you know, and then it's an incremental ways of, of uh, exploring their feelings as we as we go along, right? So uh, starting mm -hmm. with the story and then focusing on the feelings, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a, a similar type question, but a, a little bit different. Uh, but any thoughts in terms of helping uh, families who've lost a family member, uh, but the family is not wanting to talk about it, even to other family members, and it could be because of uh, death by suicide or accidental overdose. Like, how do you how do you ask those questions if you're the family member who's not in the know? Uh, but want to ask those questions about how a person uh, died? Well, uh, the sad reality is that some, you know, we, we do know that uh, even within families that some people, you know, I know people who have lost loved ones to suicide who have never talked about that again. You know, uh, even in my own, in, in the communities that I'm aware of, you know, along along our Southern Shore area. If a family member wants to know about things and there's a family member who's not able to disclose, then, um, you know, they can reach out and, and reach out to see if there's a, a third party that can maybe help uh, with asking some of those questions, uh, you know, because, you know, those people also want closure uh, around that um, for sure. But uh, I, I think it's just a matter of, of being respectful uh, in the first instance and allowing those questions to be answered and explored, you know, as as they as as time, uh, you know, and they are able, right? Uh, because I think it's it's so complicated, and uh, you know, I think it's very important too to not listen to rumors as well, because we know that rumors can abound around certain things, and just a matter of, you know, creating that space of um, seeing if if the other person in the family will reach out and and talk about it you know there's uh you know well i'm trying to give you an inspiring view of uh, suicide loss in my own story certainly this is as i talked about earlier very complicated right and it does take a, a little bit of time and it will take um you know maybe a number of sessions but certainly that's where social workers can help right they can help families uh heal and help the healing begin and help family members talk to one another, right? That's really, you know, where we can be the best of the professionals to help in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, another question in terms of uh, what are some uh, interventions that uh, you might recommend for helping people deal with those complex trauma uh, that can result uh, due to a suicide loss? Well, of course, it depends on when, I guess, you know, when, when you come in there, certainly, um, you know, crisis, uh, crisis theory and crisis work can come in, you know, immediately, uh, in terms of, uh, doing that. Of course, uh, brief therapy can certainly help, at least in the first instance, to, um, you know, uh, to help out a strength-based approach, right? Because we believe that everybody has strengths and certainly, uh, you know, wants to share. Uh, certainly, um, you know, so many theories can really be helpful in terms of, uh, you know, and not everybody agrees with narrative, right? I remember being to a, a conference once and um, there was a, a gentleman there who was from the military, the U.S. military, and I, you know, I su suggested narrative as an approach to work with survivors of suicide loss. And he looked at me in the, in the room and he said, that's an approach I would never use. He said, you know, uh, you know, they would look at a lot of different, um, you know, uh, re some, some people look at, you know, helping reflective, reflecting on the experience in lots of different ways. But certainly um, there's lots of different views. And I won't profess to be the expert on all of those therapeutic um, approaches, but certainly there's a combination and a variety that you can use. The, the normal things that you use can often work um, 
you know, just being there, being a support, you know, uh, active listening, um, you know, and all of those, uh, you know, asking questions, knowing, you know, um, allowing the person like, you know, to, um, to be in charge in that sense, right? So like, you know, um, allowing the person to share what they're able to share and doing those, uh, all those types of things. All right, perfect, thanks. Um, we have another question that's come in uh, in terms of if you have any reflections on the particularities of uh, the experience of indigenous uh, survivors of suicide loss through your work, have you noticed no, I, any, I can't any reflections say, uh, there? I can't say uh, that I have any uh, reflections of um, my work individually with um, with indi people with indigenous people. I, I did do a similar session last night, and uh, I'm doing a, in a theology program that I'm doing, and uh, I know there was some um, some a couple of people on there that were from different um, indigenous communities there and they were talking about the high incidence and prevalence of um, suicide in their communities and what one um, I think it was in uh, Rigolette uh, they were talking about how they do a walk uh, in there uh, and that allows people in their communities to um, acknowledge you know people who've been impacted by suicide and um, you know they to to help prevent suicide, but also to remember those who um, who died. But I, I personally don't have any experience myself, so I, you know it's not a particular group of individuals or um, communities that I've worked with. So I'm sorry about that to not have that knowledge no. there. No, that's that's good. Thanks, Kim. Um, so in terms of you provided some excellent information throughout, which has been acknowledged. So um, people are wondering where they might be able to access you know, some, if they want to further that around their postvention training or continued learning in this area. Okay. Well, um, I've sent some resources out that are available in the slide deck there, uh, uh, you know, certainly around, um, there's just different, like we developed a hope and healing guide here in this province that was based on one in Calgary. And I think I included one from Toronto there as well. Um, or Ontario, I think it was Toronto, but uh, just with some different, like they have some different um, guidelines and tips that so will affirm some of the things I've talked about for sure. Uh, but I guess, you know, if you see a conference in the area, if you see something around suicide loss, uh, the Canadian Association of Suicide Prevention has lots of great resources uh, on their website. There's also a survivors um, of suicide loss that, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of the American, there's lots of different websites out there. And I have um, put some of those uh, in your, uh, in the presentation there in the end. But I will tell you, uh, and there are some articles as well that I've seen, you know, um, the odd time about, uh, you know, postvention. But you know what? There's not enough. There's not enough um, people doing work in this area. There's not enough people doing research. And in, you know, and in our own province, while we're doing, we're trying to do that prevention, intervention, and postvention support, we really need people who, um, you know, are writing about this topic and who are researching so that we can help further that knowledge, right? Uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. So start with uh, some of the links I gave you there. And uh, certainly, you know, if you do Google, uh, you know, Google can be a wonderful thing sometimes. And if you Google, uh, you know, articles around survivor, survivors of suicide loss, you will find some that, that may be applicable. And Frank Campbell, who the person who I mentioned earlier, who is a su suicidologist in the States, he's a really good person to... Um, you know, to Google and uh, he has, there's lots of great resources. They actually have a program there where they do all the elements of the, the three H's of the suicide there that we talked about earlier. And they do wonderful programs there. And I know he's written about that as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, so I'm just looking at the time and not seeing any other questions come in. Some great questions. So thank you for those. Uh, but I'll just uh, wrap things up for this afternoon. And uh, really want to sincerely thank Kim for this informative and stellar presentation. 
Certainly a lot of important information was covered and regardless of your area of practice, you may be working with someone who's experienced a suicide loss and that's something that can be in all, all areas of practice. And the presentation may also have touched you personally. So we really hope that this session has provided you with new knowledge and information that you can integrate into your social work practice. And Kim, just want to say your passion for this work and for promoting, for the promotion of continuing education is inspiring. Uh, thank thank you, you so much for sharing your knowledge, expertise, and your personal and professional experiences with us today. Your work in supporting survivors of suicide loss is so critically important and essential. Thank so the you. PDF of the... You're welcome. So the power, uh, the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation, along with some great resources and articles that Kim provided, is available in the handout section on the webinar platform. Uh, so check those out. And the links then uh, throughout the presentation slide deck would be uh, there as well. This webinar will be available on demand and 24 hours using the same link you used today for the live presentation. For NLCSW members here in the province, a recording of this session will also be available on the NLCSW YouTube channel in the coming days. So before signing off, we do ask that you complete the evaluation that will appear on your screen. As always, your feedback is so greatly appreciated. So on that note, uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Kim, and stay safe, everyone.